the idea of whether or not an unborn child can feel pain and if so when well that conversation is ongoing it's a conversation worthy of a great nation is apparently a conversation that's happened all over the world we're one of seven nations in America that allow abortion on demand after the 20 week period the fifth month of pregnancy our goal is to get out of that club uh, so Austria has Limits on abortion beginning in 12 weeks, France, Germany, Spain, 12 weeks. There are no restrictions uh, in the United States. Uh, we have passed some legislation about late-term abortions, but in terms of abortion on demand, it's pretty much unfettered in America. And uh, 22 states have passed legislation similar to the pain-capable bill. And what I want you to understand, this conversation is uh, just beginning. The public is on our side. The more you inform the public about what we're trying to achieve, which is to restrict abortion on demand after the fifth month of pregnancy, because the unborn child feels excruciating pain. Uh, we know that because uh, anesthesiologists routinely provide anesthesia to the unborn child separate from the mother in surgeries trying to save the child's life. So it's pretty clear to me that medical science understands that at 20 weeks, the baby is capable of feeling pain. That's why you provide anesthesia when you operate on the baby to save its life. One can only imagine the pain felt from dismemberment at 20 weeks. Um, at that period in the birthing process, young parents are uh, encouraged to sing and talk to their unborn child because the baby begins to recognize uh, the parents. There have been occasions where people have survived at this period of time, around 20 weeks, but the theory of the case is not viability. The theory of the case is that because medical science now tells us that a 20-week, five-month-old unborn child can feel pain, is routinely, routinely provided anesthesiology, anesthesia to, to uh, deal with surgery, that there's a state interest in protecting that child from an excruciating death. Mm -hmm. and that's what this is about. And I want to get out of the club of seven. Yes. I want our country to go in a different direction. So our bill focuses on the abortionist, not the mother. And uh, I feel like that's the best way to proceed. There's exceptions for rape and incest. There's exceptions to save the life of the mother. These, I think, are very common sense, practical exceptions. But the goal here is to educate the Congress, the Senate, have votes on the floor of the United States Senate, explaining this legislation, legislation and trying to convince the American people time has arrived in America for us to understand that at five months, a baby feels excruciating pain, if not protected, and to stop abortion on demand and become um, get out of a club that I don't want to be part of. I am confident that over time we're going to win this fight. We're on the right side of history. Yes. I think we're on the right side of decency. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an emotional topic, but by the fifth month, pretty, pretty strong consensus this baby is well developed. And uh, we're trying to protect children from excruciating death. Uh, in 2013, the CDC, excuse me, 2015, the Center for Disease Control said there were 8,296 late-term abortions. The Guttmacher Research Institute for Planned Parenthood said in 2013 there were about 12,000, about 1.3%. And so this is not rare. Thousands are affected. And uh, with the people behind me, we're hell-bent on educating the public about what we're trying to do here and confident over time we will win this fight. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the National Right to Life Committee, President Carol Tob Tobias. Thank you, Chairman Graham. I am Carol Tobias, President of the National Right to Life Committee. Patients are often asked, on a scale of one to 10, how strong is your pain? We hope we never have to answer with an eight, a nine, or a 10. But unborn children are never asked that question. One-fourth of premature infants who survive at the age talking about in this legislation survive, premature children that are surviving and living. 
there is strong evidence that children who are born at this stage um, can feel pain. Abortions at this stage are performed using a very painful uh, type of abortion procedure. We heard some of those mentioned and described in the hearings. The, common, the most common procedure at that point is in having an unborn child's arms and legs twisted off by brute manual force using a long stainless steel clamping tool. To deny that children at this stage can feel pain is to deny the large body of evidence both uh, scientific and medical research are providing, uh, and it's ridiculous for anyone to even deny that it happens. We are proud to stand with Senator Graham in encouraging the Senate to pass this bill, and we hope that it will come to the floor soon. Thank you. Next, we have Marilyn Musgrove, the Susan B. Anthony List, Vice President of Governmental Affairs. Thank you, Senator Graham. Uh, I was taken today when Senator Feinstein said those of us supporting this legislation want to roll back the clock. Well, I submit to you that we don't want to roll back the clock, but she wants to roll it back to 1973, and so does Speaker Pelosi, back in the day when we were told it was just a blob of tissue. My, isn't that amazing now when we think of neonatal surgery? As Senator Graham speaks so eloquently about the baby being given anesthesia separate from the mother because the baby is a unique patient. Back in 1973, women were told to exercise their rights they had to be willing to completely diminish the rights of the unborn child, even if it was a girl. Things were very different back in 1973. We couldn't imagine the medical advances that we would see today. Viability of the unborn child has been moved earlier, one week for every decade since Roe v. Wade. Science and medical advances since Roe v. Wade are absolutely astonishing. Babies didn't have much of a chance of survival if they were born early. Those days have changed. When we had a little boy right here in the United States Senate, Michael Pickering, that was born at 20 weeks and survived, and now he is a thriving little boy. You know, we, we heard the heartbeat of babies back in 1973. Now we have the ultrasound. We look at that unborn child. I mean, it's amazing. That's where I met my first grandchild. We saw our first grandchild when his parents lovingly invited us to the debut of that little boy. That very day, he was named after both his great-grandparents. There's a reason when women considering an abortion change their minds many times when they see that ultrasound. Back in 1973, we didn't know what we know today. But we got a horrifying glimpse of abortion when we saw the shameless, brazen promotion of abortion in New York. When we heard the cavalier remarks of a pediatrician saying he knew what would happen in that delivery room if a child survived an abortion. Today, Americans support, in majorities, banning abortion after the point in the pregnancy when the child can feel pain. In amazing majorities, Americans support giving a child who survives a failed abortion medical care. Senator Feinstein, we don't want to turn back the clock. This is 2019, and we want a vote on Born Alive in the House of Representatives. Thank you, Senator Graham, for your leadership. Next, we have Concerned Women for America CEO and pres uh, President Nenets. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you, um, Chair Mr. Chairman, and with my pro-life sisters. I represent over a half a million conservative pro-life women in the United States, and we believe that this legislation is long overdue. This is a human rights issue. The United States has no business being in the company of Vietnam and North Korea and ending the life of children after 20 weeks Certainly, we, this is the very least we can do. It's a common sense step that the vast majority of Americans agree on, men and women. So I just want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for what you did today. And um, we are going to continue to work on this to educate people across the country. This will be something that will be an ongoing conversation. 
in both Democrat and Republican Senate races. We will make sure as you vote that your constituents know how you vote. We don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. This is about life, and this is about protecting the least of these. Thank you. Family Research Council, Director of Life, Culture, and Women's Advocacy, Petrina Mosley. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Graham. The most common abortion procedure takes place between 13 and 24 weeks, and that's a dismemberment abortion that tears a child limb from limb. Recognizing these raw facts was enough to convince undecided Trump voters in 2016, and enough to change even passerbyers' mind on the street, from abortion is a woman's choice to abortion is a gruesome murder. In just two minutes, these passerbyers' minds were changed. Yet we've been debating pain capable for the last six years. The scientific knowledge has already been used to keep babies alive and comfortable, and it's time we put that scientific knowledge that affirms what we already know is right to good use and further, furtherly pass the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. Today we heard some very moving and emotional stories, but I think it's important to mention that the exception to the rule should not be made the rule, and that these women deserve our care, but so do these unborn lives. Thank you. March for Life President, Jeannie Mancini. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jeannie Mancini with the March for Life, and I stand here today representing our organization, but more importantly, the collective millions of Americans who's mar who have marched for life every January since 1974. Um, our theme for the March for Life this year was pro-life is pro-science, and how appropriate for today, because we know um, that infants in the womb re release pain analgesics as early as 18 weeks, and sometimes even earlier, depending on stress stimuli. And so um, science and technology are very much on the side of life, as we've heard, we've heard uh, this afternoon and, and this morning. Um, we are so very grateful to you, Mr. Chairman, and to your committee today for the hearing. Um, we've heard a lot about polling today, too. We know that the large majority of Americans are favorable towards this legislation. It's really shocking that it's taken so many years to get this passed. We're talking eight out of 10 Americans for 10 years strong, including six out of 10 pro-choice Americans would limit abortion more than it's limited in the United States. This past week, we organized the very first annual Virginia March for Life, and we had a crowd of about 7,000 people supporting this. So I agree, Senator Feinstein, we're not going back to 1973. In fact, the large majority of Americans support this legislation. So the March for Life stands with you, Senator. Thank you very much. Last, Americans United for Life President and CEO, Catherine Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This legislation is critical. It is critical to protect those precious unborn children in the womb who are capable of feeling pain as science has demonstrated, and it is critical to protect their moms who at those later term abortions are at such increased risk of severe long-term consequences and even of death. This is a long overdue conversation in our nation. It is a conversation that we cannot afford not to have anymore. And this legislation is in line with the Constitution. You know, so much today what we heard from from our, our colleagues on the other, or your colleagues on the other side was, um, was language about division. Um, and I would submit that in fact the division that is taking place here is only uh, at that leadership level. It's a, it's, it's a disagreement about language, but it's not a disagreement uh, with the American public. The American public, as we have seen, um, even though we may have had 44 senators vote against critical life-protecting legislation, born alive legislation here, we know that the American public, uh, through Americans United for Life's own poll, 66% of self-described pro-choice Americans oppose late-term abortions, oppose birthday abortions, and oppose that radical practice that's been proposed in a couple of states where some uh, abortion activists have gotten a little bit desperate and, um, and are just out of touch with the public. They oppose infanticide. Um, I myself am post-abortive and have lived with a lifetime of regret. And I know that it is time that we all stand with you, Senator Graham, and start to protect those precious unborn children and to protect their moms in our nation. That is what a humane society does. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Questions? Um, 
Well, I would ask the opponents of this bill to dispute the fact that anesthesia is provided routinely to a child who is in the fifth month of the pregnancy to protect the child from the pain <clears throat> that would occur to save its life through surgery. I would ask them to explain the, the case just described about somebody who survived. Common sense tells you when you look at the ultrasound, you know, 10 fingers, 10 toes, moving around. Uh, I think science is on our side. I would argue that the fifth month of the birthing process is eminently reasonable for anesthesiologists to protect the baby against pain. The question is, is it eminently reasonable for the United States to um, ban abortion on demand based on the theory that it would be an excruciating death? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think Senator Manchin might be. Um, this is taken on a character of um, uh, a debate about early uh, first trimester abortions. I think the polling data shows that America is very divided on early stages in the first trimester, but the closer you get down the birthing process, the more the consensus. And I'm confident that if six and 10 pro-choice individuals say that, yeah, at this point in the pregnancy, I'm okay with limiting abortion. I think most people, once they know about what we're talking about, that will gain momentum and this will become law. Well, if we had changed the filibuster rules, every state advancement in terms of the right of the unborn would have been repealed. <laughs> uh, let's get through this, then we can. Senator, you heard from some of the mothers who had fetal anomalies yes. during pregnancy. Why not create an exemption for the health of the fetus? That's, that's a good question. 38 countries who ban abortion in, in the fifth month have uh, fetal anomaly exceptions, 60 don't. Uh, my belief is that the, the approach we've taken is sound and we're gonna stick with it. And if anybody came to me and said this would change your mind, I might talk to them. Well, I, I assume that the countries who've passed this law, that they still have doctors. So I think that the problem she was talking about is real access to health care. I just don't see how you're improving access. The debate on access to health care is not advanced by allowing the dismemberment of a baby in the fifth month. I think they're two separate issues. At least in my mind, there are. Okay, anything else? Yes, ma'am, one more. So the game plan would be to have a markup. I'm not, you know, under any illusion here. Uh, getting 60 votes will be difficult anytime soon. But this is a journey worth tr taking. Yeah. How long the journey, I don't know. The cause is just and worthy, and yeah. we're in it to win it. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to accept what he gives me unless you can give me a reason that there's something inappropriate left out. I will be fine with the redacted version. I will be absolutely fine with protecting grand jury testimony because the law says we should. I'm absolutely fine with not releasing classified information uh, in circumstances where we should not. I trust his judgment. Uh, I think he understands that more transparency the better, but we are a nation of laws, and because you don't like Trump, there's no reason to change the law. Okay. Yeah, I feel very comfortable with the bottom line conclusions that he's given us will be supported by the report. I don't think he's lying to us. Uh, I have no desire to retry the case here. It's over. It's over for me, unless there's something in the report that suggests 
uh, Mueller did not say there was no collusion or he did did not find, if he says, you know, I can't decide on obstruction, you decide, the decision by Barr is okay with me. If the report indicates no collusion found by Mueller, that's it. Done, over, for me. Let it go. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, they, 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 they did not have that attitude in the past. Oh. Yeah. No. No. I think they left out number 17, MBS. There's no doubt in my mind that the killing of Mr. Khashoggi uh, was orchestrated by, approved by, and with knowledge of uh, the Crown Prince, that his method of operation against dissent has been pretty consistent, and that the uh, course of action that I choose to take is to hold him personally accountable. Thank you all very much.